Welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Julia Rothkopf and I'm the Program Associate at YIVO. Today we have Dr. Samantha Cooper joining us for a talk titled American Jewish Women in New York Opera Culture, which is an event in collaboration with Carnegie Hall. This talk will be followed by a response from Judith Pinellas, the Associate Director of Instruction and Education, I mean, sorry, Instruction and Engagement at Berklee College of Music and the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. For those of you who do not know YIVO, we are a very special place for the celebration, contemplation, and exploration of Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture. We are located in New York City, where our library and archive contains over 40, 24 million documents and 400,000 books. And these resources are used by research, researchers all around the world, including Sam, um, who used some of our documents for her research that she's presenting on today. We also have tons of classes on Yiddish language and culture, exhibitions, and public programs just like this one, where we aim to bridge the worlds of Jewish culture and our vast library and archival collections. Today, we are very excited to have you all joining us. Um, Dr. Samantha M. Cooper is a historical musicologist who specializes in American Jewish cultural history. She received her PhD in historical musicology at New York University in 2022 her doctoral dissertation entitled Cultivating High Society, American Jews Engaging European Opera in New York, 1880 to 1940. Publications have appeared in the Journal of the Society for American Music, Journal of Synagogue Music, Journal of Musicological Research, Musicological Research Society for American Music Bulletin, and Musica Judaica. She currently serves as the Associate Executive Director of the Mus Jewish Music Forum, a project of the American Society for Jewish Music. And now I will turn it over to Sam. Wonderful, thank you so much. Should I give you a second to share screen, Julia? Perfect, thank you very much again. Okay. On March 15, 1933, soprano Quina Murillo made an unusual request of the delegates of 200 constituent branches of the Federation of Jewish Women's Organizations at their monthly meeting at New York's Temple Emanuel. There, Murillo issued a plea for the support of the Metropolitan Opera Company, which faced an unprecedented $115,000 deficit as a result of the ongoing Great Depression. The Met required at least $300,000 of immediate support to ensure that there would be a future opera season. As the New York Times reported the following day, the Jewish women delegates were receptive to Murillo's request and unanimously promised Mrs. David E. Goldfarb, president of the Federation, to refer Miss Murillo's plea to their respective groups, which had a membership of more than 100,000 women in the metropolitan area. But why did the esteemed Metropolitan Opera House decide to ask the Federation of Jewish Women's Organizations for its financial support in 1933? After all, doesn't requesting a donation necessitate at least a familiarity, if not an ongoing relationship between the beneficiary and the donor? To me, this anecdote bespeaks a much more enduring relationship between American Jewish women and the New York opera industry than has ever before been recognized by opera study scholars or American Jewish historians. The Met's financial request of the Federation only makes sense if we can account for the robust local Jewish women's engagement with opera that preceded it. In today's presentation, I will use assorted archival, oral history, and press findings to trace the lengthy relationship between Jewish women and the New York opera scene, which together heralded the Met's plea for aid. I find that Jewish women's participation in New York opera culture was enormously diverse. They could regularly be found attending operas and purchasing opera-related goods advertised to them in the Jewish press. Many also recognized opera as a powerful mode for social and racial uplift. Opera regularly featured in the social services and educational entertainment organized for incoming immigrants by established Jewish women. And of course, Jewish women worked for the opera industry in various capacities. Though their contributions as opera singers are well known, their work as ballet dancers, artist managers, vocal coaches, concert organizers, costume designers, and conductors have received less attention. The Jewish women invested in opera were not only confined to the elite class, rather those from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, nationalities, political orientations, and religious affiliations, all found in opera, a shared tool for acculturation, 
or what musicologist David Conway terms social entryism. Today's presentation attends not only to the reform wealthy debutantes of German speaking lands who subscribed to season tickets, but also to the working class immigrant woman from throughout Eastern Europe who stood for hours in the family circle to hear their favorite arias. After briefly situating Jewish women within the larger framework of gendered, musical, and American Jewish immigrant history, I will make a case for why they chose opera of all genres to serve their many personal, personal and communal goals. Next, I will discuss Jewish women's opera going, their consumption of material opera related goods, their philanthropic and educational uses of opera, and their varied professional roles in the opera industry. Tracing women's lengthy relationship with opera culture reveals how the balance of power so drastically shifted from Jewish women relying on opera to the local opera industry relying on them. A discussion of Jewish women's roles in any industry necessarily begins with recognizing the challenges of studying women's experiences. Practically speaking, women can be difficult to trace throughout the historical record. With changes in marital status often come changes in name. In fact, one of the subjects I'll be speaking about later today, opera coach Jessie Burnt, changed her name four times following consecutive marriages. Additionally, changing social perceptions of women working in the public sphere, not to mention ever-present misogyny, have ensured that the record keeping of women's accomplishments remains sparser than those of men's. In response, scholars, as music, musicologist Kimberly Francis puts it, must actively create room to celebrate the work of powerful historical women and employ creative pursuits to uncover them in the historical record. In many ways, Jewish women's participation in American musical life mirrored patterns established by their non-Jewish counterparts. Most American women's musical activities evolved from domestic, amateur music making and teaching to performance and attendance, to patronage and organization of public events. Like their non-Jewish contemporaries, Jewish women observed a religious tradition. They had to behave in ways deemed respectable by dominating male culture makers. And they served as what whites it terms keepers of culture in religious and secular spaces. However, their experiences in opera were also continuously shaped by their Jewish subject positions. The specter of Sneas prohibitions like Kol Isha and Shomer Nagia overlay Jewish women's possibilities for advancement in music and especially in vocal performance, even if the majority who pursued this line of work were not religiously observant. The Hebrew Standard noted that the reason why there seems to be, quote, very few Jewish female opera singers or concert singers, end quote, in public performance in 1914 was because the Jewish girls of the more refined classes from which classes the modern artists are derived are very reticent, reserved, and brought up in a very strict manner. The article gave the example of contralto Adelie Metzger Laderman, who apparently underwent, quote, a very great struggle with her family, end quote, to pursue a vocal career. Additionally, like other racialized women of the era, especially those from African-American and Italian immigrant backgrounds, Jewish women's racial in-betweenness impacted not only how they perceived opera, but also how the opera industry treated them. But first we need to address a, if not the central question, why opera? Well, opera appealed to Jewish women for several reasons. It was a genre of music familiar to multiple generations of Jews from across Europe. In urban cultural centers like Vienna, London, Berlin, and Odessa, Jews frequently came into contact with opera. During an oral history interview for the Leo Beck's Austrian Heritage Collection, violin teacher Edith Eisler recalls how during her adolescence in Vienna, quote, her folks loved to go to the opera and began taking her when she was six or seven years old. At the same time, opera in the United States underwent an important shift in the late 19th century that helps to explain its enduring appeal to Jewish women. As cultural historian Lawrence Levine explains, opera became increasingly sacralized in the American entertainment hierarchy and associated with the upper classes as it moved into new venues called opera houses, intentionally designed to segregate opera for more popular vaudevillian fare. As opera took on associations with upper class American standards and gained clout for its ability to empower disenfranchised populations, so too did its perceived ability to aid Jewish women and their charges with a parallel cultural ascendance. 
Coverage in newspapers and memoirs substantiates the Jewish woman from across socioeconomic classes attended the opera. While articles in the American Hebrew and Jewish Messenger and the New York Times recognized philanthropists Mrs. Albert Guggenheim and Mrs. Ernest Ehrman as annual travelers to the Met, the Hebrew Standard similarly documented second-generation American writer and speaker Mrs. Esther Ruske's status as a habitué of the opera. For Adelaide Wolf, the wife of philanthropist Otto H. Kahn, participating in the Met's governance and philanthropy served as an extension of her familial responsibilities. Wolf would attend opera with her husband, make generous donations to the Met, host guests from the Opera House, and serve on the Met Opera Guild and Association boards. From the other end of the economic spectrum, infamous Lithuanian-born Jewish anarchist Emma Goldman recounted attending a performance of Carmen at the Met in her memoir, Living My Life. Therein, she details the discomfort she experienced in the standing room as a result of wearing her, her new shoes for the occasion. And if you'd like to learn more about Goldman's opera love, I would encourage you to check out my latest article in American Jewish History. In spite of these Jewish women's different backgrounds, they shared a belief that attending the opera could be a transformative experience. They also realized that Jewish women were expected to look like they belonged among their peers in high society. Sitting in an opera box suggested that a person had ultimately obtained the most wealth and by extension, social elevation. Even though Jews could not own their own opera boxes at the Met before Khan became the first exception in 1917, Affluent Jewish women and their husbands frequently rented or subscribed to opera boxes in earlier years for either the regularly scheduled opera season or for private events. Similarly, discussing opera emerged as an important cultural activity for Jewish women living in New York, especially those in the middle and upper classes. Associations with opera became a means of demonstrating good taste in music and even better taste in apparel, company, and status. The Jewish press reinforced these perspectives by circulating news of upcoming performances and opera seasons, as well as by publishing celebratory lists of Jewish singers. They also published opinion editorials and even stories about opera. In response to an 1882 Jewish woman's request for assistance titled, What is to be done? The men won't call. Writer Leah Cohen Harvey asserted in the Jewish Messenger that young Jewish women needed to be able to socialize with young men about opera in order to secure a husband. Similarly, in editor Minnie D. Lewis's 1892 article for the American Hebrew, she suggested that every primary school should offer, quote, a course in proper everyday behaviors, end quote, to teach children, quote, the table dicta of polite society, end quote. And of course, quote, knowledge of the correct way to comport oneself on all occasions, including in the theater or at the opera. Imaginings of Jewish women's racial uplift also graced the pages of the Jewish press. When in 1920, the American Hebrew and Jewish Messenger published non-Jewish writer Yetta K. Stodard's Yellow Elbows, the story of a Jewish girl's faith in her abilities as a singer and the happy consequences of that faith, the paper and author framed knowledge of opera as possessing the inherent potential to contribute to Jewish women's racial uplift. In this work of fiction, a Russian Jewish immigrant girl successfully uplifts herself from, quote, the class of yellow elbows, end quote, to, quote, polished ivory flesh tints, end quote, through operatic education and performance. Many Jewish women's earliest associations with opera derive from being the targets of marketing campaigns in the Jewish press and consumers of opera-related clothing, accessories, beauty products, instruments, and music technologies. Since Jewish studies scholar Andrew Hines and Jeffrey Chandler observed that material acquisition and consumption became an increasingly sacred mode of socialization for Jewish immigrants in America, it isn't all that surprising that Jewish women wielded their purchasing power as an avenue of their opera engagement. At the same time, opera itself was already a very materialistic enterprise. One of the chief strategies developed to elevate opera from popular entertainment was, as historian Bruce McConaughey explains, setting a code of behavior, including a dress code, deemed proper when attending the opera. Accordingly, several advertisements in the Jewish press, presumably placed in the papers with the help of Jewish men serving as editors, emphasize the drive towards uplifting and even whitening Jewish women consumers. The Jewish Messenger's Fashion Notes column of the 1880s gave Jewish women advice on what they should wear for evening and opera occasions. A series of 1890 ads for optician William Dengler's opera glasses in the Jewish Messenger 
complete with a sketch of a refined looking woman using his products, assured readers that his opera glasses would add grace, give dignity, and lend comfort to every lady who acquired them. By 1922, Lord and Taylor's first night's advertisement, published in the American Hebrew, esteemed the donning of fashionable gowns, wraps, and furs for an opera or play as an illustration of a woman's joint taste and refinement and her leadership abilities immediately after women had won the right to vote. In the most literal sense, opera attendance began to garner an association with racial uplift among Jewish women as advertisements for cosmetic products marketed to Jewish women capitalized on connections between the allure of opera going and racialized notions of white femininity. In the American Hebrews 1887 ad for Dr. James P. Campbell's Arsenic's Complexion Waters, the doctor promised a transparent complexion and finely textured skin guaranteed to prompt copious invitations to the opera. The Hebrew Standard's 1911 ad for Plexo Evening White Makeup, meanwhile, claimed to be indispensable to the woman preparing for dinner, opera, or ball. Acquiring opera goods came to symbolize Jewish women's respectability. Opera glasses were one of many beautiful things for sale at Jewish events, or they were gifted as tokens of gratitude by men to their wives and mothers for their service efforts to Jewish organizations. The American Jewess, the first English language newspaper written by and for American Jewish women in the 1890s, um, in that paper, readers who acquired at least 10 new paid up subscribers were promised the gift of a fine opera glass. And though it might seem contradictory today, American Jewish women did not understand their participation in the religious dimensions of Jewish life and their consumption of opera goods as mutually exclusive endeavors. Rather, as Jewish historian Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet has observed, as a result of the movement of Jewish holiday celebrations out of the home and into the public sphere in places such as opera houses, the Jewish holiday calendar fortuitously converged with social seasons and shopping cycles. Her observations align with those of a writer for the Hebrew Standard in 1908, who reflected that although Jewish women in New York still dressed in white for the days of awe, now they wore, quote, opera cloaks and satin slippers and they come to show themselves, such that even the synagogues and temples are so many exhibitions in millinery and dressmaking, end quote. Substantiating Jewish women's opera glass ownership, a monogrammed set of bejeweled opera glasses owned by American Jewish philanthropist Mrs. Florence Schloss Guggenheim is preserved today by the Museum of the City of New York. Likewise, the rose-colored silk Delphos dress and belt bought by 25-year-old Mrs. Bertrand W. Kahn in Paris to wear to the Met in 1936 is held by the National Museum of American History. Owing to opera house's inherent grandeur, physical size, and exceptional acoustics, Jewish women believed that hosting their communal events in opera houses, more so than in other venues, could signify their collective ascendance into the privileged spheres of American society. Beginning in the 1880s, Jewish women regularly utilized New York opera houses to host fundraisers, Jewish holiday celebrations, and even political rallies. Participating factions included an astonishing number of New York-based synagogue sisterhoods of personal service, ladies' auxiliaries and benevolent societies, the National Council of Jewish Women, the Young Women's Hebrew Association, and Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization. Their events ranged from complete operas and operettas to musical reviews, opera excerpts, and overtures. The names of famous participants and box holders would often feature in publicity materials. When the Beth El Sisterhood arranged a benefit performance of Lucia di Lammermoor at the Met on Tuesday, March 6, 1900, they obtained explicit permi permission from Jewish manager Maurice Grau and the Metropolitan Opera and Real Estate Company to resell the stockholders' opera boxes for profit. As the Jewish paper celebrated, the Sisterhood's fundraiser succeeded at swelling the coffers of their treasury. Another vital example from the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum was the political rally held at the Met following the deaths of 146 largely Jewish poor immigrant female workers in the Jewish-owned Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire on March 25, 1911. The most memorable moment of the rally, which was held on April 2nd, 1911, was when Polish-born Jewish factory worker Roe Schneiderman offered a deeply moving speech from the stage. Schneiderman passionately berated the civic leadership for their neglect and encouraged all working people to organize and take collective action to prevent such a tragedy from ever recurring. 
According to writer Leon Stein, Schneiderman's words effectively calmed heightening tensions between the working class in the galleries who fought for class solidarity and solutions to industrial safety, and the middle and upper class women in the opera boxes who argued for reforms and the creation of a bureau for fire prevention. The irony of holding a post-tragedy rally intended to draw attention to the privileging of property over human life at the Met was apparently lost on the non-Jewish organizer. Connecting the opera with moral uplift, Jewish-run women's organizations and individuals arranged many opportunities for children, teenagers, and immigrants to engage with the genre. In 1885, the Ladies Deborah Nursery hosted a benefit entertainment by the Talia Opera Company for a group of, quote, young ones who would otherwise be strangers to the most ordinary comforts of life. And I think the implication here is that opera is an ordinary comfort of life. Similarly, a performance by the Lady Sewing Society of the Hebrew Orphan Asylum for its orphans in 1892 included the quartet from Rigoletto and a duet from La Traviata. In 1895, um, an initiative called the George Eliot Literary Circle, held at the Educational Alliance, set out to introduce working class Jewish, Russian, and American born girls between the ages of 14 and 17 to, quote, the grand life of humanity, end quote by teaching participants about Wagner's ring cycle and taking them to the Met to see two operas. The Jewish press commended the circle for its transformative impact on its participants, relaying how, quote, most of the members are now fully fledged young ladies, end quote, who continue their education at college. In the 1925 to 26 operation notes, the New York section of the National Council of Jewish Women even listed a children's opera group as one of the responsibilities of their committee on immigrant education. And as late as 1940, the Yiddish Forward reported that 14 East Side boys and girls who had won a music or essay contest were awarded tickets to a performance of Lock May at the Met. In 1918, Mrs. Minnie Guggenheimer began an outdoor summer concert series at Lewison Stadium on the City College of New York campus in what eventually became the longest running educational opera initiative organized by a Jewish woman. Her voluntary venture, which frequently included opera excerpts and full-length operas, lasted over 40 years and entertained thousands of immigrants in the New York area at nominal prices. When she was asked in a 1924 interview why she had started the summer concert series and undertaken what her daughter later called a full-time unsalaried job as impresaria of the world's largest scale musical project, Guggenheimer replied, quote, because I realized that New York starved for good music during the summer. A group of us came together and began working for a solution of the problem of how to extend education to others who might in this way acquire a taste for the best art without knowing that they were skirting culture. Eventually we hit upon the stadium idea. Here was the admirable background, the space which would allow us presentation at popular prices because of mass accommodations." End quote. Like other Jewish woman philanthropists of her time, Guggenheimer's interest in disseminating and legitimizing a particular elite sense of good taste through music drove her to arrange these symphonic and operatic performances. Of course, the vast majority of Jewish women to participate in opera culture did so as by singing on the opera stage. By 1880, Jewish women could be found performing throughout the New York area in venues ranging from the Academy of Music and the Met to the Lexington Opera House and Town Hall. While household names like Alma Gluck, Issa Kremer, and Beverly Sills may be familiar to many of you, other performers who are rarely documented as Jews in opera history include Frida Langendorf, Rosette Ande, and Rita Fornia. Rather than discussing these singers who could easily feature in books of their own, my goal today is to reframe them as cogs in the machine of the larger New York opera industry. While certainly exceptional for their talent, they were just as essential as the many other working professionals who have not yet received their historical due. Like singing, ballet was another vital component of opera with similar ties to Europe and associations with refinement. These factors made it an appealing career path for Jewish women from immigrant families who found in the art form a compelling opportunity to participate in the local labor force. Some of the many Jewish dancers from working class American backgrounds who began their ballet careers as students at the Met Opera Ballet School and in the Met Opera Corps de Ballet in the 1910s and 20s included Helen Tamaris, Rosa Feldman, Nora Kay, Ruthanna Boris, and Muriel Bentley. 
Visiting ballerinas too left their mark, most notably St. Petersburg born prima ballerina of rumored Jewish descent, Anna Pavlova, whose United States tour brought her to the Met in 1910. Offstage, a handful of Jewish women worked in more surprising roles. German-born Jewish concert artist manager, Annie Friedberg, had an office in the Met from 1911 to 1926, and she managed the bookings for over 100 artists during her over 40-year career. Ironically, she has been eclipsed by her more famous brother, pianist Karl Friedberg, in spite of the fact that she managed his career too. In 1914, Musical America observed that Friedberg was, quote, one of the few woman managers of musical artists who has met with success in artist management. Another notable, absent from most opera histories, is the vocal coach and accompanist, Jesse Burnt, a convert to Presbyterianism born in Amicus, Georgia, to German Jewish immigrants. She spent her career helping singers interpret their roles for the opera stage and lived in a studio apartment above the Met. Burnt, who earned the designation the vocal coach and guardian angel of prima donnas, even told a New York Times reporter that one of her only rules was that she would never take men as her students. During World War I, Burt converted her apartment in the opera house into a war relief station, demonstrating how Jewish women could bring elite opera spaces deliberately into touch with global circumstances. Meanwhile, Gretel Urbans created costumes for 18 productions at the Met. Her talents were contracted out of the New York studio of her more famous father, architect and scenic designer Joseph Urban. The whimsical, colorful examples displayed are from Gretel's designs for the Met's productions of Le Conte of Mine and Turandot. Unfortunately, in spite of immense coverage of her father's career in the press and at Columbia University's archives, I have not been able to locate any pictures of Gretel. Finally, Parisian-born pianist, opera conductor, and vocal coach of Dutch Jewish descent, Lena Cohen, made national headlines in early February 1917, when she became the first woman to conduct an opera in the United States. The day after her debut performance with the Cosmopolitan Opera Company, the New York Times proclaimed, quote, woman wields the baton, Lena Cohen conducts a performance of Carmen in Garden Theater, end quote. While the New York Review added, quote, Madame Cohen is first of sex to wield baton in grand opera in America, end quote. Unfortunately, far from remarking on Cohen's prowess as an opera conductor, the reporters commented only on her decision to wear a plain suit to the performance. Musical America, meanwhile, used condescending language to label Cohen, quote, an ornament to the operatic conductor's chair, even if she may not yet occupy that of the president, end quote. They also equated her conducting debut to her, quote, turning the trick, end quote, which was clearly a euphemism for prostitution. Cohen, in turn, issued a statement in response, reminding the public that she had not, quote, invaded the orchestra pit with the idea of making a sartorial display of herself and wished to attract attention solely by the caliber of her reading of the score of Carmen, end quote. And so, by the time soprano Quina Murillo approached the Federation of Jewish Women's Organizations at their monthly meeting to ask for financial aid on behalf of the Met in 1933, there is no doubt that New York's Jewish woman had come to rely on opera as a tool of uplift and as a viable pathway into the workforce. For the first time, Jewish women found themselves occupying a new empowered position from which they could choose to bestow or deny aid of their own on the struggling opera house. In light of American Jewish women's decades long engagement with opera culture, that the Met then sought out their financial support seems a somewhat fitting place to conclude the narrative. By the beginning of December 1940, the Yiddish Forward featured a photograph of Met opera star Lily Pons shaking hands with Mrs. Joseph Hammerstein, president of the New York chapter of Hadassah, in anticipation of an upcoming performance of Lachme on December 14th that would raise funds for the organization's work in Palestine. Armed with opera, American Jewish women set out to fashion themselves and others as socially respectable and acculturated in line with evolving expectations of American Jewish womanhood. Though Jewish women may not have always conducted opera-associated actions as Jews first, their diverse voluntary and labor efforts constitute a significant but overlooked part of the narratives of American Jewish culture and the American opera history. American Jewish women's embracing of opera sheds light on the vital roles that music has often played in helping minorities to integrate into the fabric of American society. Thanks so much.
All right. Thank you so much, Sam. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, now, providing a response to the to, to Sam's present to Sam's presentation to her talk will be Judith Penelis. Um, Take it away, Judith. Uh, first, thank you, Samantha, for a tremendous presentation and for the many, many insights your research has made. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, share slides. Okay. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Samantha Cooper has asked us to look at American Jewish history and culture with a new lens. In the presentation you just heard, Dr. Cooper utilized a case study of the Met to re-examine Jewish history, not only from a feminist perspective, but goes beyond this methodology and gives us a new way to approach understanding the processes of acculturation and assimilation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Using this lens, she considered and re-examined the Met, not only for cultural production and the soundscapes the Met created, but for the Met itself as an institution, as a new way of having a Jewish space and ways, if you will, of Jews finding their place through the various works and volunteer roles of Jewish women. Dr. Cooper provides new evidence to the proposition that Jews have not only been shaped by America, but have in turn shaped America and its institutions. Attending performances at the Met working at the Met and supporting the Met were all ways women shaped their futures. Of course, showing off those spectacular gowns and jewelry was yet another way, stepping up by stepping in to the Met. Samantha points out that Jews used attendance at the Met as a method of social advancement, of being seen by the right people, remembering also that the Met was founded in part to be a place for the then new industrial money people to have a place to show off their wealth and establish their social status as opposed to the old Academy of Music. So one might conclude that from its inception, the Met acted in this capacity of status building for non-Jews as well as Jews. As the Herald reported in October 22nd, 1883 on the very first opening night of the Met, quote, Many surprises were in store last evening for that portion of fashionable and unfashionable New York society, which had arranged for itself to go to the Metropolitan Opera House. Perhaps the first notable one was the disagreeable shock received by those who had thought to purchase the luxury cheaply. The reporter continued, the audience itself was a complete surprise, not in proportions. It was certain that the house would be full. But those who were expected by the habitués of places of amusement in New York were not there, and those who were not expected were in full force, unquote. Samantha's paper prompts us to ask, what are the processes that allow people to feel, quote, at home in a new world or in a new culture? Here at the turn of the 20th century, we see a society in which Jewish women expanded their roles from homemaker to that of society matron, and as artists devoted to dance, to design, to directing, and to high art. In gathering up all the evidence and artifacts with which these women surrounded themselves, we have been shown the ways in which people Americanized. It was not enough to shed the scheidel or to change one's clothes into finery. Rather, to feel American, to be accepted, refinement and participation were key. The methods of acculturation that Samantha has examined at the Met show consumerism as a new way of measuring this integration into society. Samantha's important question, why talk of the Met? Why did Jewish women choose opera as a way to raise their social status? Well, for one thing, of course, the simple answer is that it was not the only institution that provided an outlet. There were myriad examples all over New York of Jewish women's participating in other social and cultural institutions, or in fact, helping to create new ones, including music schools and educational venues. Opera achieved a higher social status than many of these others, 
possibly due to its connectedness to one of its important achievements of uplift and education. Those ideas retained by German Americans who dominated musical culture in America of Bildung, where music and the arts were a form of personal spiritual uplift. And this was understood by Jews of that era. Just as Jewish women's participation in large choral societies or home performances were not seen merely as women's accomplishments, but as methods of self-uplift and betterment. So were the activities at the Met. For many Jews, musical activities blurred lines between duties to home, synagogue, and outside community. So it is not surprising to see Jewish women giving time and money to a musical society in a variety of ways. Right from the start, the Metropolitan distinguished itself from other common entertainments. And one way was the mere fact of it staying put in a permanent home with a significant operatic season. Opera in the United States had often been done by touring companies in the 19th century. And these operas were sung in English. The permanent in-house Metropolitan started with performances all in Italian, then everything in German, and finally operas, with a few exceptions here and there, were presented in their original languages. This helped distinguish opera as an upper-class institution for people who had studied and understood various European languages versus the traveling opera companies, which made sure opera was more accessible by all uh, to all for, by using English. Jews of various socioeconomic status turned out en masse to hear opera, but also for other cultural institutions that came to be associated as high culture markers, ballet, symphonies and chamber music, museums and art institutions, literary societies, and so on. Jewish involvement was significant also because of a dramatic Jewish population growth in a city where, in less than 30 years, the population went from around 80,000 in 1880 to about 25% of New York's entire population in 1910. During this period, I have not found particularly that Koli Shah played a significant role deterring Jewish women's participation in opera as much as the general societal stigmas associated with being an actress which was still considered a somewhat suspect profession. The upper classes and those striving to enter the upper classes were quite wary of allowing their daughters to pursue the operatic stage, given the opera's association with acting. Marriage itself was at risk. Once married, women generally left the concert stage, not just in opera, but for any performing or concertizing event. In addition, opera work involved traveling, also socially risky for single women. Thus, we see that John Philip Sousa's band, which toured widely and which always had female instrumentalists and vocalists, many of them single Jewish women, explicitly and consistently chaperoned the women to protect their reputations. There is another aspect to Jewish women's intersection with the Met, the phenomenon of stardom. The life story of one opera singer may prove a particular of particular interest here. Josephine Jacoby was an opera star with the Met who was active as a soloist for Temple Emanuel on the concert stage and singing for Jewish community causes that Samantha pointed to. Her career after the Met was as a vocal coach and singing teacher, one of the many overlooked roles for Jewish women artists, as Dr. Cooper has pointed out. However, during her tenure as a Metropolitan singer, she enjoyed tremendous celebrity and status and fame. Josephine Jacoby was already a superstar by her mid-career at the Met, which spanned the years 1903 to 1908. The measure of celebrity and credibility Metropolitan stardom gave, especially to Jewish women, might be seen as an additional aspect of the intersections of the Met with Jewish women as the following story may illustrate. Jacoby was traveling and performing as a member of a large contingent of the Met during the spring of 1906. On the evening of April 17th, they presented Carmen in San Francisco. The next morning, the great earthquake and fires of 1906 happened, which destroyed the city. 
Jacoby was extensively interviewed as a credible witness who escaped with difficulties and experienced those traumatic events. While hundreds of survivors who left San Francisco traveled east, including several members of the Met Entourage, it was Jacoby who was interviewed in the Chicago for the Daily Tribune and in and the New York Times. Another interview with Jacoby was conducted as soon as she arrived in New York, and two column story appeared in the New York Times. Given her fame, bestowed by virtue of being a Met star, Jacoby's experiences were of interest to the general public. Dr. Cooper has led us to a wide open field of study. There is much to explore and understand in the relationships of Jewish women in the arts and especially music. We are just beginning to uncover the intersections of Jewish women and institutions and how this affected their musical and social places in America. Samantha, I look forward to hearing more about your research and findings in the future, so thank you. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to you for assembling this PowerPoint and for your comments. I think they really did um, tease out and add to everything I was able to share today, and I so appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you both for this wonderful and illuminating presentation, for two wonderful and illuminating presentations on New York Jewish opera culture. So we do have a bunch of questions from the audience. Let me just get to them. Um, I guess to start, so we heard a, a lot about these different, um, about how women contributed to New York opera culture in general. Um, someone is asking in um, particular about Beverly, Beverly Sills and how she um, is part of this whole picture. I know that Sam, you mentioned her briefly, but how does she contribute to the broader picture? Yeah, Beverly Sills is a phenomenal example of exactly this narrative. And I actually opened with the example of Beverly Sills in the first presentation I ever gave for YIVO um, and the Center for Jewish History at the end of my year-long fellowship in uh, May 2021. So I would encourage you to go check out at least the opening of that. And basically what I have to say there about Sills is that um, you know, today, I think there's a lot of pride in everything that she was able to accomplish with the New York Opera Company and um, her, of course, her long decades long career as an opera singer, and her, even her advocacy for children's deaf foundations and um, children's foundations as a result of her own children's challenges. Um, but opera scholars today don't often see her at all as a Jewish woman. And in fact, it's completely omitted from one of the recent biographies that came out about her life. Um, so I think that that sort of really attests to some of the challenges that um, a person or scholars working at the intersection of American Jewish women studies, opera studies, um, Jewish history is faced with when they think about someone like Beverly Sills, because it's important for us to consider her many diverse facets, her contributions in the opera scene, but also the fact that she was a Jewish woman and that impacted things about her life that um, otherwise wouldn't have been, you know, noticeable at all, like the fact that she did change her name um, to Beverly Sills. Wonderful. Um, yeah, Judy, did you want to comment on that as well? I want to point out that Beverly Sills teacher, Estelle Liebling, was also a Met singer and oh. had traveled with John Philip Sousa extensively um, and was also one of those people who became a singing teacher. And I think she said something like some 70 plus students who went on to sing at the Met. So there were Jewish women in these additional roles uh, that were involved with Beverly Sills as well. So the kinds of things that you pointed out, uh, Samantha, that the singing teachers and the people who were preparing people for singing at the Met, many of them were Jewish teachers as well, especially these women. There were many women involved there. Absolutely. And actually, if you look online, there's an incredible picture of um, Sills and Estelle Liebling behind a piano together. Um, so you can kind of see them in action captured. They were captured, I think, in Life magazine and yes. in places. So it, was, it was a very well-known phenomenon that she studied with her for, for over three decades. Yeah, for sure. All right, great. We have another question um, about how Jewish women started getting involved in opera because they were barred from 
buying box tickets and so what did it take for them to get into the boxes and how did they first get involved in opera culture? Yeah, I think I would actually love to toss this question back to Judy because she can maybe speak in a little bit more depth about people like Madame Europa and some of the earlier European Jewish women who were singing, you know, much earlier than the American scene. So from my research angle, I can talk quite a bit about how ex mostly exclusively Jewish men were making the opera scene function even in the 1860s when there was this influx of Moravian Jewish impresarios um, that Ruth Henderson talks about as having um, worked at places like the Academy of Music and taken artists on various tours like Joseph Hoffman. But the story about American Jewish women, especially singing opera, starts much earlier back in Europe. Well, that's right. And uh, women, of course, uh, started singing opera. And I think even in the 18th century, I have some uh, a few names of people who were sing Jewish women who were singing opera. And um, we also know that in the 19th century, especially as there were more and more freedoms for Jews in Europe, uh, people became more educated in the arts. Jewish women turned to opera as they were not singing for the synagogue. And many, many daughters of cantors became opera singers. Um, and this was an avenue for a really good musician to, to pursue. Um, and then we see that uh, the same thing happens in the United States, especially with the er early immigration, let's say early 19th century, with German Jew uh, Jews that came to the United States. Uh, there were many women who were musicians. They were educated in Western European culture. Uh, one in particular that I did research on, um, and Julie Rosewald, who became uh, very well known in one of the touring companies uh, in the United States. It was an English opera and settled in California and served as a, a cantor in a synagogue. So the ties between synagogue and the opera uh, were, were well known. And that relationship also carried over into people like Josephine Jacoby, who sang in Temple Emanuel as a soloist. And there were many women soloists in um, reform congregations in New York, in the New York area. That was, uh, there were also many choral groups as well, you know, choirs and synagogues at that time. So many of these women sang in multiple venues, not just the secular concert stage, but in the synagogues as well. Yeah, that's completely right. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's great. We have another question um, about European versus German Jews. And so I'll just read the question. Um, so you've kind of hinted at this a bit by talking about class issues and efforts to educate 20th century immigrants. But I wonder if you might speak a bit about the divisions between those American Jews who were descendants of the mid 19th century German immigrants and those who were either themselves or descendants of the Eastern European immigrants who started arriving in the 1880s and how participation in opera culture might have worked into this relationship. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that came from Rachel Edelstein. So thank you so much, Rachel. Um, on that, I really have to say that I was doing my best not to overemphasize the fact that these are often perceived in Jewish history as two distinct groups. I think there's a lot more overlap than we might like to admit. And historians like Hasia Diner have really taken apart the notion that there were these successive waves of Jewish immigrants that had strong opinions about each other and, you know, everything was just so and these groups had clear divides. I think that that's perhaps um, it would make us easier. It would make it easier to be a historian if that was the case. Uh, but I don't think that that's necessarily true. However, I would say that um, something else I tried to attend to, or at least to hint at a little bit, is that once Jewish immigrants have come and they establish themselves, whether it's the 1860s or by the 1880s, and then the next group of Jewish immigrants is coming from wherever they're coming from, that first group is often providing the social services and educational opportunities and immigrant aid for the new group because they've had the chance to become established. They've had more time um, than the group coming in. So um, I think that that's really the way that we see this playing out, that we see perhaps if we want to call them the German Jews or the German speaking Jews come um, in the 1800s, they get settled, they create the services that they need to make America their new home. And then as the next generation comes, then they offer them the chance to access these new social services that they've created. And opera, of course, plays into that in some of the ways we were able to show today. 
One of the things uh, is in the United States, um, the, how people understood opera in the 19th century different than the 20th century. And the Met was one of the institutions that helped change that notion. And that is in the 19th century, Americans considered opera popular culture. And opera houses, or they were called opera houses that were built all across the nation, had more than operas uh, in them. There were different kinds of uh, programs and acts and genres of music and theater and so on. Uh, that's just what they called them at the time. Uh, in many, many of these places, if you go and they call it, the new opera house was built. Well, it had different kinds of purposes in those communities. Um, and in the opera culture that happens is you see this transition from touring companies uh, where operas didn't have enough, say, business to stay in one town for a long time. So they had to go from city to city by train uh, to kind of, you know, do a few days here and a few days there and, you know, have enough of an audience. By the time you have a stationary New York, the Met has a stationary operatic this is, a, this is an amazing change in the way that things were done, where you have uh, a group that's a, 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 that has its own house and its own place and its own season, um, and it can be in one city. That was dramatically, uh, you know, that's very big and a part of uh, American uh, musical history. So I think that that in and of itself uh, starts to change the nature of what the opera was. And as Samantha pointed out, all of these social changes that people put into, well, let's make it, you know, dress up and let's make sure that, you know, the rich have their own special boxes and, you know, and that whole uh, capital system at play there, uh, creating a kind of uh, upper class uh, myth mystique to the process uh, was, part of what happened at the Met. Yeah. Um, we have another question, I think one that's very interesting about names and Jewish identity. So someone um, as an anecdote has told us that their great great aunt followed founded the opera in Miami with their great great uncle during World War II, and both of them changed their names um, in order to hide their Jewish identity throughout their entire lives. Um, how did this manifest um, in the research that you did? And how like, did women change their names um, in order to combat anti-Semitism in opera? Yeah, that's a great comment and question. And I actually think before I address your question about name changing, I want to point out something else that your story alludes to, which is that this phenomenon of Jewish women and Jews in general in the New York opera industry is just a case study. It's happening and being replicated all over the United States and other major urban centers. So we see parallels in San Francisco, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, um, in Boston. And in each case, of course, the story looks a bit a little bit different and the key players are a little bit different. Um, but you know, it's not just New York where Jewish people suddenly decide that opera is the genre for them. It's really happening all over America. So that's the first thing that I think your story about Miami points out. Um, the other thing I'll say about name changing is that it was actually an incredibly popular phenomenon among especially um, Jews at this time. And that's another aspect that I actually talk about in the earlier presentation. So again, I'd encourage you to check that out because I actually created a kind of statistical analysis to think about, well, how common is this thing? Like I keep seeing that, you know, I'm reading these biographies and this person changed their name and that person changed their name and they're both opera singers how common is this? And I think the statistic ended up being like 30% of the 80 singers I looked at in the New York area did undergo a name change specifically because of the career they'd chosen in opera. Um, you'd have to look at the presentation for the exact statistics on that, but it was really common. And ex you're exactly right in highlighting that there's something here to this idea that the Jewish experience is specific because there is this kind of looming um, concern about prejudice that people are facing. And as they plan, how are they going to make money and put food on the table for their families? They have to think about things like, how is my name going to be perceived? You know, I think it's a really interesting phenomenon about stage names, not only for Jews, but we also see that there were non-Jews 
who maybe grew up in middle America someplace, went to Europe and changed their name to an exotic, maybe Russian or other exotic name. So they would have cachet when they came back because there was this phenomenon that uh, people who wanted to study the arts, especially music, would go to Europe to be trained. Uh, there weren't the facility to be able to get to that level in the United States or people didn't think they could. Uh, Josephine Jacoby actually is one of the first women to sing at the Met who was entirely trained in the United States. Everybody else had gone to Europe to get their training in opera and, and singing. That's where the teachers were. That's where the university uh, conservatories were. And um, some of the people who went there changed their names to more exotic European names <laughs> instead of, you know, your... Uh, uh, English nondescript name. So stage names and changing names for the arts is an interesting phenomenon that is not just about anti-Semitism, but a, about the whole phenomenon of um, who had the authenticity. You see Germans changing their names to Italian names so that they, because they were singing in Italian operas, they wanted to have Italian names. I mean, so it's, 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 all kinds of which way mished up and uh, um, it's not just one way with just only Jews changing their names. No, I totally agree with that, Judith. I think the only mitigating thing to keep in mind though is just that with the Jewish examples, we see them justifying why they did it. And often as in the case with Beverly Sills, it's, well, we can't put you know this name on a theater marquee, right? And it's there's this instant connection to the fact that it's because of a Jewish background that these people cannot be put out the way that they were born and advertised to the public like that. Right. So yeah, so that's really the only sort of factor I would keep in mind. I do agree with that. And that also played out in Hollywood as well, not just in, uh, in the musical arts, but in the film and theater. Um, we have another, I think, really interesting question about how the different outreach that the Met used to reach Jews. Um, and so you've mentioned a bunch of those during your talk, Samantha, and how did those um, compare to outreach to other immigrant groups? Yeah, that's a great question. I think remembering the difference in relationships that each of these immigrant groups of the period were able to have with the Met, just as a result of what was happening in the immigration era and the larger factors in American society at that time is really important in trying to conceptualize this question. So for instance, African-Americans were pretty much full stop kept out of the Metropolitan Opera House until the 1950s when Marian Anderson was finally able to have her debut. And we do see a handful of sporadic examples of African-American ballet dancers and um, various personnel kind of sneaking under the radar. Um, but by and large, the, the whole, their whole relationship with opera in New York at that time was um, what I think scholars like Lucy Kaplan have thought about as being kind of a shadow culture, um, even Naomi Andre too. So it's a really kind of a different relationship with the genre at that time for that population. I think the closest connection would be with Italian immigrants, where you're looking, when I looked at least in the archives, I was seeing a lot of um, Jewish events at the Met, and I was seeing Italian immigrant communities events at the Met. And I think that they, in their own way, were able to forge a very similar relationship with the institution to what Jews were able to accomplish. Um, in terms of the Irish community, if that's of interest, um, I have a colleague who is uh, a scholar of that um, area, and she's basically said that we find a lot less um, Irish connection to opera because the community in, in America is very interested in returning home, and they're very interested in propagating specifically Irish Gaelic community events. Um, and not so much invested in European modes of culture like opera. So I think in each of these scenarios, we have to think about, you know, what is what is important to these communities? You know, what is their reason for investing in these cultures? And how are their circumstances different in the country? And then by proxy with the institutions of opera in the city. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question as our hour winds down. Um, I think a good way to end would be speaking a bit forward, more forward in time. So what what is currently happening today with Jewish women in opera? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, from personal experience, I can say I have many colleagues uh, who are 
currently uh, Jewish women opera singers, uh, mostly in the Canadian context. But uh, in terms of the industry, I don't feel like I have the expertise to really talk specifics about what is happening in the North American and even the New York opera industry at this moment. Um, I do think just moving past the 1940s, which is kind of the era, era I left things into the 50s and 60s, we really start to see sort of what others have called the golden age of Jews in opera performance. Um, I don't disagree with that. I think we, you know, suddenly there's a lot more visibility and opportunity for singers like Sills and Peters and all of these really big names of that moment. Um, and I think that there are reasons for that and they probably need some, some grappling with and some thinking through. But um, I think we really do start to see less of um, less fear about opera singers being um, forthright about the fact that they are of Jewish backgrounds. And as a result, there are more known names of Jewish performers in the opera industry um, following the 1940s. All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you, Judith. This was a wonderful conversation um, about a really, really interesting topic. So thank you both for being here. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.